Hi everyone and welcome back to The Journey. As you can see, today we're going to be talking about pediatrics, in particular, developmental of dysplasia of the hip, okay, also known as hip dysplasia. So, this disorder is related to an abnormal development that can happen within the fetal life, infancy, or even childhood. And what is actually happening or what is taking place is that the head of the femur is sitting improperly into the acetabulum or the hip socket, okay? So, of course, later on this is going to cause uh, problems with balance, walking. So, the hip right here in this area, the bone that is in this region is the pelvis, okay? You have the ileus, which is up here at the top, and then within um, there's like an opening or uh, indentation where something else is joined, that is your acetibulum, okay? And then the head of the femur, which is the longest bone in the body, right? The head of the femur sits into the acetibulum, um, so that way you're able to move and function properly, right? But in this case, there's a disconnect. So either this is not fully in here, whether it's sitting on, on itself improperly, or it's, it's um, out, almost like a hip dislocation, okay? So when you think of hip dysplasia, you can think of a hip dislocation, okay? So hip dysplasia, hip um, dislocation, okay? Um, not saying that's the only thing that can occur, but it just helps you kind of remember, oh, this is like what a hip dislocation is for an adult, but just in a kid, okay? In pediatrics, and in infants, and things like that. So with this, you have degrees of developmental dysplasia of the hip, okay? So it's based on severity. And the first one that I have here is acetibular dysplasia, which is your preluxation, okay? So this is your mildest form. There's three different forms. And it's neither a subluxation or a dislocation, which I'll get to that when I get to the other degrees, okay? So you have a delay in acetibular development that occurs, okay? So there is going to be a delay. And femoral head remains in the acetibulum, okay? So within this degree, it's not the fact that there's a dislocation or a subluxation because that's not what this degree um, talks about. But... It is a poor development of the acetibulum in itself. So this didn't develop properly, okay? So even though it's sitting in the acetibulum, because this is not developed properly, I'm still going to have um, problems with my hip area, okay? Because it's, it's, not, it's not in properly, okay? But it doesn't mean that it's not in the acetibulum at all. Now we have the second degree, which is your subluxation which consists of an incomplete dislocation of the hip. So pretty much what it means is a partial dislocation. So um, the femoral head remains still in the acetibulum, all right? So this femoral head is still in the acetibulum, all right? But the stretch capsule and ligament, ligamentum teres causes the head of the femur to be partially dis displaced, okay? So there's a, a area here where you have the ligamentum um, teres where it is uh, uh, stretched or elongated, which causes this head of the femur to not sit properly into the hip socket, okay? So that is what's going on with the subluxation, okay? And now with the dislocation, all right? The dislocation is the worst one out of all of them because at least the other two is within the acetibulum where this one, there's going to be a detachment. So the femoral head loses contact all right, with the acetibulum, and is displaced, okay? So it is completely displaced, posteriorly and superior, um, superiorly over the fibrocartilage rim, okay? So this area here is not even um, um, within the acetibulum, okay? So the head of the femur is completely dis um, displaced, okay? It's not sitting in the hip socket at all. All right, and the ligamentum teres is elongated and taut, the same as the as the um, ligamentum and teres here. It's elongated, all right, and it is this pretty much what the dislocation is is a displacement of the bone from its normal articulation within the joint. Okay, so when you think of the word displacia, you can think of displacement. Okay, so hip displacement, and you have the three different degrees. You have the preluxation, which is the acid. Uh, acetibulum uh, dysplasia where it's still in the socket there's a poor development of the um, 
acetibulum, okay, that, which is why it's not joined properly. Subluxation, which you have an elongated of the ligamentum teres, which causes it not to sit properly, but it's still connected to the acetibulum. And then, of course, the last but not least, the total dislocation uh, where the acetibulum and the head of the femur is not joined into each other, okay? And those are your different degrees of hip dysplasia. So I put some fun facts up here just to know about. All right, so girls are four times more affected than boys with hip dysplasia. The left hip is three times affected than the right hip because of um, fetal positioning, intrauterine uh, positioning where the left side is affected more just because the fetus is against the mother's sacrum, um, more on that side. It is more common in infants who are in breech position, okay? And breech position is pretty much instead of the head being face downward to be able to come out of the birth canal, the feet are face downward instead, okay? And then as far as genetics goes, it is 20 to 50 times more common in infants who has a first line relative with hip dysplasia. So that lets you know that it is high likely, it's very um, likely that uh, you'll see a child who has a relative in the first line generation, like a brother or sister or so, with uh, hip dysplasia, okay? So now we have our clinical manifestations, which is also known as our signs and symptoms, which is our nursing assessment. So within the neonates, you may have a laxity of the ligaments around the hip. And as far as infants, we have a few. Uh, we have shortening of the limb of the affected side, and then with that, this is where you have your Alice sign, or also known as a Galis sign, but more people are using the Alice sign more, and um, term more. And what it is, pretty much, you're going to flex the feet upward against the baby's gluteal areas, and what you're going to do is you're going to see, look at both feet in comparison and look to see if one is longer or shorter than the other, okay? So um, if it does get confusing, I'm going to send a link into Put a link into the description box showing you a video of how they do the Alice sign, okay? Also, you have restriction abduction, all right? And abduction, when it's spelled A-B-D, that is away from the body, all right? So abduction is to go away from the body. A-D-D, adduction, is your, think of adding to the body. So A-D-D, add, I'm going to add to the body, so that means I'm coming inward. A-B-D, I'm going away from the body, okay? So they have restricted, restricted, sorry, abduction, so they're not able to turn outward as much because of the affected hip, okay? When they're, when they're placed in a supine with the knees or hips flexed position, okay? You're also going to see unequal gluteal folds, okay? When the baby is in prones and the legs are extended against the examining table, all right? So you will see more gluteal folds on one side than the other, all right? Or you'll see series of folds. Also, you have a positive Orlando sign um, or test, positive Orlando test. And with this, you're going to check for hip instability. And what this test is going to do is the examiner is going to abduct, so I'll move away uh, the thigh and apply pressure uh, forward over the greater trochanter, cancer and you're going to hear a clicking noise okay so that's why I put it in blue right you're going to hear a clicking noise that indicates that the femur is moving into the acetibulum so that means that the hip is outside so once I do that rotational click right if I hear that that means that the the femur, the head of the femur is moving towards the acetibulum, which if it's moving inward, that means that it's out of place, all right? And then last but not least, I have my positive Barlow's test. And with that, the examiner adducts, which um, bring into the body, right? So adducts the hips and gently apply pressure down and back with the thumbs, okay? And what you're doing is you're looking to feel the femoral head moving out of the acetibulum, okay? So it's gonna be a feel of it moving outward, whereas the ortolani uh, or, sign or test is pretty much a clicking of the femur head going in to the acetibulum. So ortolani test is a clicking going in where Barlow is a feel of the 
um, femur head moving out. All right. So I'm definitely going to go ahead and put links into the description box showing you the different testings that you can do. And that way you can get a better illustration because I know I said a lot of terms with the adduction, abduction, and it can yeah, kind of get confusing. So sometimes when you see a visual, you know exactly how that test is um, being tested and what's going on, what's occurring. So um, remember to check out the, the description box if you do need uh added assistance for that. To continue on with clinical manifestations, we have in the older infants and children, you're going to see that the affected leg is going to be shorter than the other side, all right? The head of the femur is going to be felt moving up and down in the buttocks area when you extend the child's uh, thigh upward to their head and then pull down distally, okay? So, um, you know, just kind of watch out and just look to see if you see that the head of the femur is moving with um, by the buttocks area, okay? Also, you have a positive trend in Dellenberg sign, which pretty much you're gonna tell the child to stand on one foot at a time, and the foot that is affected, of course, they're gonna have some weight bearing or um, support in that area, and what you're going to see is that at the pelvis, instead of it moving upward, like what it would normally do, normally, as I'm, as I'm moving left to right, the hip moves upward, the pelvis is shifted upward. Whereas okay, in the case of hip dysplasia or dislocation, you're going to see that the hip is going to be moved downward, the pelvis is going to be moved downward. All right, so a positive Trendelenburg is pelvis tilt downward on the normal side instead of upward. All right, and I kind of uh, underline it and highlight it so that way you can kind of see what a Trendelenburg sign is. Right? Um, so it jumps out at you, hopefully it does. Also, the greater trochanter is going to be more prominent, so it's, it's visible, it's easier to see. All right, and then you're gonna have marked lordosis, and pretty much lordosis is pretty much an exaggerated back. That's what I like to say. Um, it's pretty much, because we all have a, a curve in our back, but that one is more of an exaggerated curve. So it, it looks more like this. You see it uh, mostly in, um, Women who are pregnant, they're carrying a baby, so all of that weight is shifted this way. So it pronounced the back arch more, and uh, that's what, what, what lordosis is called, okay? Or they may have a waddling gait if they have bilateral dislocation. So they're going to be waddling. And another, another um, group of people who waddle is pretty much the, the, um, the pregnant mothers, right? They have edema, they're getting closer to their pregnancy, right? They're shifting their weight on one side to the next to the next. So that waddling gait you will definitely see in a kid who does have hip dysplasia the longer it takes to be treated. So the main thing here is that you're going to see a significant limb or difficulty in walking the longer this disorder takes place to get treated, all right? And some diagnosis to screen to make sure that, you know, this kid does have it or does not have it is you want to make sure that you screen before the age of walking, which that tends to be somewhere around one year old, okay? So you definitely wanna make sure that you've done these diagnosis tests before they start to walk, okay? And that's when it's really going to affect them. Um, the ultrasound is going to be done for the infants who are under the age of four months, and the x-ray is done over the age of four months. And then these also, these testing also assist with the diagnosis. I already stated the Alice sign, the positive Ortolani sign and the positive Barlow sign. And the positive Barlow sign, um, the Barlow test is done normally in babies between 8 to 12 weeks. Okay, that's when that test is done. So sometimes you may have a misdiagnosis. Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, whoever is the medical examiner who is doing that, they're doing it properly. Um, one thing when they're doing the Ortolani sign, which is the clicking noise that you hear, you want to make sure that they do one leg at a time. Some people do it bilaterally, but you get a more effective um, diagnosis when you do one leg at a time. So that way, you know, um, you can really get the uh, proper anatomy. So then that way you know when you hear that clicking that there is a dislocation. Because again, the longer it takes to be treated, the more complications you have, especially when it comes to walking. All right, so to continue on with the interventions, all right, so from birth to six months of age, usually the child is going to be seen splinting of the hips with a pelvic harness, okay? So with the pelvic harness, the goal is to pretty much maintain flexion and abduction 
and external external rotation okay it is worn continuously and when I mean continuously I mean like literally all day maybe 23 hours of the day the only time it may come off is when the child is um, um, given a bath or maybe have sponge blocks here and there but for the most part it is worn continuously all right and this is done until the hip is stable about three to six months so and I know your poor baby is going to be in this thing for three to six months but the ultimate goal with the technique of the pelvic harness is to um, allow the spin to still have movement, okay? Where um, the, the child, you know, during development, they're, you know, figuring things out about themselves, they're looking at their hands, they're grabbing their feet, they may be putting their um, toes in their mouth, you know, they're exploring and they, they still need those vital um, times of movement, but you want to kind of restrict that movement in a way where their hips is still able to heal and function properly once they get older. So with the pelvic harness, it is definitely going to be from birth to six months. And I say that again because those are your test questions, you know. When do a child use the pelvic harness or, or you know, a child from birth to six months, what treatment technique are they going to be using, you know. And you may see, you know, different options. You need to know right away, hey, they're trying to test my knowledge of um, from growth and development, their age, which one is they're going to be using. So pelvic harness, pelvic harness, pelvic harness, okay? And then for the ages of 6 to 18 months, okay, you want to gradually start having reduction by traction by either a closed uh, reduction or an open reduction, okay? And if necessary, they may have to go under general anesthesia for this, okay? The child is then going to be placed in a hip spiker cast, okay? So hip spiker cast is going to be for two to four months until that hip is stable, okay? Whereas the pelvic harness is going to be within three to six months until that hip is stable. So I'm just kind of pointing out those differences so that way if you do have any test questions of, you know, how does the pelvic harness versus the uh, hip spiker cast, you can kind of see those differences, okay? So this is for six to 18 months. And this is from birth to six months, all right? And this one, they're going to be using this cast for two to four uh, months until the hip is stable. Once those hips are now stable, then they may have flexion and abduction. A brace could be applied so that way um, it can further, you know, uh, aid in the treatment. And that is going to be for approximately three months, okay? So after the hip is stable for two to four months, they're going to be in a flexion abduction brace that may be applied for an additional three months, okay? Now, I put two things here. They're not really fun facts, but they're uh, important information to know about. With the hip spiker cast, there is going to be an opening around the stomach area that is definitely to prevent the compartment syndrome. Because remember, your stomach is something that definitely can expand, especially um, when you eat a lot. And I know some of you guys are like, yeah, there are times when I'm just greedy and you just keep on eating, 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 and you eat to the point where your stomach is now so full or distended, you feel uncomfortable. So same aspect for a baby, you know, when they're eating, their stomach do expand. And remember, a cast is something that is very restrictive. So if, you're, if that stomach is expanding, right, those, organ, those organs are now pushed or displaced, right, and now they have this forceful pressure that is trying to contain it. Remember, that compromises circulation. The main thing about cast care is about your circulation, CMS, you know, circulation, movement, and sensation. So you definitely want to prevent anything that feels restrictive to the body. So there's an opening in the in the. Um, stomach area just for that reason, okay, to prevent compartment syndrome. And I say this again because this just may be a test question, okay? And also opening for poop and urine, right? Because you don't want this child for the next, what, three to six months, right? Or two to four months. And what, well, yeah, two to four months. So we're talking about the hip spike of cast. So two to four months, you don't want this child, um, you know, trapped with their urine and their feces, right? So you want to make sure that there's a hole, <laughs> so that way it's easy access. You can um, change them, put a diaper on, and keep it going. Okay? So they do have an opening for that. And also, last but not least, in older children, um, 
they are going to have surgical interventions, so they're going to be an operative reduction and reconstruction um, that is usually going to be required, okay? For, so for your older kids, it's pretty much like when you take them into surgery and you have older adults where they have the hip fracture or they have hip dislocation, they do uh, open um, internal fixation reduction or so. Um, their own is going to be similar, but of course it's going to be fit for a child, but surgery will take uh, place, okay? And you'll still follow the steps, you know, um, after surgery, postoperatively, so that way you're not um, ruining what the doctor had just fixed, okay? So you're definitely going to have, you know, set up things that you want to teach the parents, you know, um, to prevent further complication or a dis dislocation to occur. And last but not least, you want to provide teaching, 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 teaching. And one thing you want to teach the parents is pretty much proper care of the pelvic harness, proper care of the hip spiker, and the abduction brace, okay? Because all these things are going to be new to them, especially if this is their first baby. And even if it's not their first baby, first time they ever have to deal with this, you know, because the first baby may be fine, second baby may be fine, and all of a sudden the third baby has a hip dysplasia. Okay, so it's still new to them and you want to teach them and make sure that they're comfortable, you know, take going home and taking care of their baby. So with the pelvic harness, you want to definitely check two to three times for the day on the skin. All right, you want to check the skin for any skin breakdown and you only want to take off the brace during your skin checks and bathing. That is it. So like I said earlier, you want to make sure that this harvest this harness is pretty much on 23 plus hours of the day because they don't really take an hour to bathe the kid. So you want to make sure, especially their small bodies, so you definitely want to make sure that, you know, it's on pretty much continuously is the main objective, the main goal. All right. If they have the spiker cast, right, the main thing you want to teach them is cast care. So you want to monitor for CMS because that's the main thing with the cast. And the CMS pretty much stands for your circulation, your color, movement, and sensation, okay? Because you definitely want to make sure that, you know, their extremities are not looking pale, that, um, you know, when you when you touch them, they do have a good cap refill that is, is blanchable, right? Because it's almost as if when you tie a string around your hand, Right? When you tie that string, you cut off circulation and you start to see discoloration. Eventually, no circulation gets to that area. What happens? It starts dying. It starts getting necrotic. Right? If you don't want those complications to occur. So same thing with um, the cast symbolizes, right? Because it's something that is restrictive upon the body. Okay? So it can interfere with circulation right and cause you know uh discolorations to occur because the body's not able to adequately provide blood perfusion to those areas so that's the main thing when it comes to cast care you want to check and if you want more information about cast care i have another video about club foot where i go more in depth about cast care and the things that you need to know but here are some few tips um, keep the cast dry, okay, so avoid getting it wet, avoid lotions and powders, okay, maybe you may be able to use the lotion and powder on the upper extremity, kind of keep it away from the lower extremity, I know growing up, you know, at, at least Caribbean thing is the island thing, they love to drench the baby in powder and lotion and make them smell good and sweet, right, in this case, you don't want that. So um, if you do have to put lotion because you don't want your baby dry, you want to put it on the upper extremities away from the cast because you don't want to put it in the stomach area or down here, you know, or powder in the in the, um, the genital areas because it starts to cake up. The lotion starts to get in the, get around the skin, make it moist, and from there you have the potential for skin breakdown, which you do not want, right? Because ultimately you want to be checking the skin. Checking the skin, make sure that there's no irritation, there's no rash, there's no breaking of the skin, all right? So again, definitely want to make sure you avoid those things. Also, avoid putting items in the cast. I know the baby may be itchy, complaining of itchiness, and you may want to take like a hanger or something and kind of like poke it down in there. You don't want to do that because if something gets stuck and it can't come back out, you are just adding to the restrictive area and causing uh, like that, that, that string, that analogy that I, that I told you about with the finger, it's almost as if you just pull that string tighter and you put the baby more at risk for um, uh, circulation problems which you do not want. All right. Also, you want to prevent complication that results from immobility, which is your breathing, you know, um, deterioration of the skin, neurovascular um, problems, which goes back to the same talking about the CMS, 
uh, fluids and fiber. And you may say, what does that have to do with anything, right? Remember, um, when you deal with a patient post-op day one or so, the main thing is you want to get them out of bed if possible or post-op day two because you want to prevent complications. That's why you give them an incentive spirometer, right? Because sitting down there and all those secretions just kind of sit and just, you know, stay within the body and not being able to come out, right? Causes pneumonia, aspiration, um, and also atelectasis, which you do not want. So you definitely want to monitor their breathing, make sure that they're taking nice, adequate breaths in and out. You want to be checking their skin, right? Um, neurovascular fluids and fiber, right? Most of the time when you're active and stuff, that kind of helps to stimulate the GI tract, which causes you to have your bowel movement. If you start seeing that, man, my kid is constipated because they're up, they do have limited movement, right? You definitely want to make sure that, you know, they have good, adequate fiber intake. All right, and now you the last thing is the main important thing, right? Well, second to last thing is promoting a normal growth and development for your for, for the child. And I understand, you know, it's gonna be hard because you know your expectations of having a baby is kind of uh, distorted now because you know you have to deal with these complications, which no one really plans for. Because when you're thinking about a baby, you're not thinking about a disabled baby. You're not thinking about a baby that has uh, disorders or dysfunction or um, have you know disabilities. You're not thinking about about those things. So when it hits you, it kind of alters your whole world of now having to adjust, even if it's temporary, you know? It just wasn't planned for. But you definitely want to make sure that you're engaged with them, all right? So you want to involve the upper extremities. They can't use their lower extremities. Involve the upper extremities, you know? Uh, you can do the peekaboo. Uh, movements with them and games and you know just allow them to reach for certain things and bring toys their way um, and make sure they engage in all five senses you know have them smell certain things you know say you know play different games um, with them you know especially when they are you know older than six months where their their cognitive ability is starting to enhance and you know they may recognize your face and you know they want to move around and, and play especially in that 18 months right because 18 months that's, that's a year and 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 six months where you know other kids are probably already walking they're potty training you know and this kid is kind of um, being delayed and they may you know get sad or, or you know eventually get, get to the point where they feel bored right and you don't want that so you want to engage all five senses you know think outside the box get creative you know bring toys into 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 the aspect you know toys that they can play with that they can engage in you know um so that way they can still have somewhat of a normal growth and development process all right and you want to teach them about their feedings and their safety okay so that is pretty much it. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave in the uh, comment sections below. Um, remember to check the description box for any added information. And again, if you have not subscribed, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and click that subscribe button. And if you also want to follow me on Instagram, I'll have that link in the description box. And again, thank you for coming on this journey, and I'll see you on the next one.